And I told Debbie, I said, perilous times are not coming. I said, they're here. They are here. But you know what? The good part of it is, the good news is, the signs of the times means we're getting ready to check out. Yeah. We're standing at the boarding gate, people. We're standing at the boarding gate. We've got our ticket in our hand. We're just getting ready to check out. Amen? Amen. John chapter 6, look at this. And the Bible said here, in verse 66, I'll read one verse. From that time, many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and read another verse real quick. Many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Amen? Proverbs 14 and verse 14 said, The backslider in his heart shall be filled with his own ways. Here's what I want to talk to you for a few minutes that I'm going to make it quick. Why people dry up on God. Why people get in church, get fired up, and then they dry up. Nobody wants a, anybody that has a depressed attitude. Nobody wants a doctor with a depressed attitude. Nobody wants a coach with a defeated spirit. Nobody wants a lawyer with a pessimistic outlook. So why should Christians have that kind of outlook? Oliver Wendell Holmes said he was a member of the U.S. Supreme Court for over 30 years. He said at one point in his life, he said he explained his choice of a career by saying, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted like undertakers. Did y'all get that? He said, most preachers act like undertakers, act like they're miserable. And that's the way a lot of Christians are. And I wonder why some people dry up on God. There's a reason for that. It's, well, it's, it's, it's wonder, you wonder why some people get on fire for the Lord. Somebody preached it here about three weeks ago. They was up here preaching. I believe it's Brother Mike Gray maybe, and a couple of them may have said it. They said, you know, the Jubilee's here, and you're excited, you're fired up. And it's a, I mean, you'll wait for this all year. They said, just in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, some of you, uh, the fire's going to die down. It's going to die down to a trickle, and there'll just be a little flicker, just a flickering. And it'll be all you can do to hang on. But that's the key. You've got to hang on. You've got to have faith. We serve God by faith. We don't serve God by our feelings. If you do, you'll surely quit. You'll surely quit. But the Bible tells us over the book of Galatians, if we faint not, we'll receive a reward. We're supposed to just keep on going. But why do people dry up on the Lord? I've watched it over the years. I've seen it. And I know you can't stay on fire for the Lord. I'm not on fire for the Lord. Most of the time when I preach, I'm not fired up for the Lord. I do it because that's what I'm supposed to do. I do it because I'm called to do it. I am do it because God wants me to do it. It's my job. I'm supposed to do it. It's like it's like when you get up on Monday morning and, and you wake up and uh, and you wake up and the alarm clock goes off. You don't get up and go to work because because it's payday. You don't get up and go to work because it's a sunshiny day and the birds are singing. Maybe it's raining. Maybe it's 20 degrees. Maybe it's one of them days that you had to wrap your pipes the night before. But you get up because it's your job and you know you're supposed to do it. And you know it's the right thing to do. And that's the way serving God is. But I'll give you a few things why people dry up on the Lord. I've racked my brain over the years. I've wondered why people just get out and they drift away and they quit on God. It's heartbreaking to watch people get out of church. You watch them get in and you watch them get out. But here's a few of the reasons. Number one, the focus is gone. People lose their focus. You've heard me preach this over and over and over. You say, preacher, you're preaching the same thing. Well, maybe you ain't getting it. Maybe you just ain't getting it. Maybe that's why I'm having to repeat it. Maybe you just need to get it. When, you, when uh, people lose their focus, when you do, uh, you, some people need to get their focus. I was talking to Brother Tommy uh, yesterday. He called me and said, brother, he said, uh, he said my cancer scan was clean. He said, praise God. He called me last night and said, glory to God, everything looks good. He said, brother, he said, I was down here at this hospital in Tampa. And he said, there's people coming out there. He said, it's heartbreaking. He said, it keeps me close to God when I come down here every month or two, every half. And he comes. He said, there's a woman come in there. said she had a big growth on the side of her face. He said, it's the awfulest thing, brother, I have ever seen in my life. Big old cancer on the side. He said, it went up her neck, up the side of her face, on the side of her head. And said, she's a young woman, too. So that thing's eating her up. And she's coming at cancer center. He said, boy, yeah. He said, it'll make you refocus. He said, it'll make you think about your blessings. He said, it'll make you think about how good God is to you. I said, you know what? That's the truth. He, I said, most of us are so blessed we're spoiled.
transform. I said, God's so good to us. We're healthy. And we got money. Got our bills paid. Got a nice car and a good job. Everything we ever wanted. Everything we ever dreamed of. And we're just spoiled to death. And brother, I tell you, it can do us good to go to these places where people can't even lift their head up off the pillow. I'm going to tell you something, brother. I've been to some of them places, to the burn center up in Augustus. I've been to the, I used to have to go to the burn center in Charleston, South Carolina. I used to dread going up there. That's a horrible place to go. It's like a death ward. And you can smell them pe- people's flesh that's burnt off their body. And their fingers are burnt off. And their noses and ears are burnt off. And they're laying there. And they're human beings just like me and you. And them people's babies. And their kids are laying there and they're burnt to death. And they love them just like you love yours. I think, oh God, how are these people going to survive this? And I walk back out and get my new truck and go home. And there's my little girl swinging on the swing set. And she comes running out and hugs my neck. And I think, my God, we just go through life and never give God a second thought. Brother, I tell you, we need to refocus on what God's done for us. That's what's wrong with us, brother. That's why we drop on God. We just sit around. God's been so good to us, and He's blessed us. We don't even see what we should see. People get disgruntled and discouraged and start getting out because their vision gets blurry. Go visit the cancer ward. Go to the hospital. I don't know how many times I've said this in my preaching career. People like using that word career. It ain't a career, I can tell you that. But I've said this a thousand times. You asked my wife, I said, I said, brother, just wait a minute. You're not looking at it right. You're not looking at it right. You're, I said, ma'am, sister, you're just not looking at it right. You're not looking at this thing right. And the devil's got you messed up. You're just not looking at it clearly. You're looking at it through a blurred vision. I mean, you, you, everything's out of focus. It's like your glasses are turned sideways. Those of us who wear glasses, if they ever get knocked off your head, man, the first thing you want to look for is your glasses. You can't do nothing till you find your glasses. Or if you lose a contact, man, everything's out of whack. You can't see nothing. That's the way a lot of church people are. A lot of God's people. I mean, bunch of children of Israel got out there in the wilderness and they start complaining. And they said, we got this manna. And we got this. We, we remember how it was back in Egypt. Man, they just need to get their vision cleared up and refocus on how good God was to them. God brought them out of bondage. Living under an evil emperor. Living under bondage. Living as a bunch of slaves. Amen. But I want you to know, God's been good to us. God's brought us a long way. God God saved our soul from doom and damnation. He brought us out of darkness and brought us into the marvelous light. Amen. Your church family don't seem so bad when you're in a tragedy. People gripe about their church family and talk about everybody in the church. When your house burns down, they all look pretty good. When you're laid in a hospital bed, they all look pretty good when they start coming to visit you. Your preacher ain't so bad when you're in intensive care and he comes by and he prays for you and comes to see you every day. That's right. I know how it is. I know how it is. All right, listen, when you're backsliding, everybody else is wrong. And you ain't done nothing wrong. Everybody else is at fault. But brother, when you're in a tragedy and every, everybody else is wrong but you, but when you're sick, and when them kids are laying in a, in a hospital room and the doctor says, there ain't nothing else we can do. Oh, brother, your church family, them's the ones you love and you want them around. You can care less about their faults. You can care less about their weaknesses and all that other stuff. Brother, it's like your natural family. You'll fuss and quibble and fuss and squawk. But brother, when somebody else comes into the front yard, you'll fight the neighbors over your family. That's why people say, well, I don't see why. I don't, I don't see why we have to do that. I don't see why. I don't see why the preacher wants to do that. I don't see why. I don't see why. I don't see why. Because you focus. Get your focus right. Get focused on the right thing and you'll start seeing clearly. Amen. That's why they take these little boys and put them with the Big Brother program. Because the more time they spend with the Big Brother, the right influence, them little, brothers start, them little boys start turning out right. The more time you spend with the Lord and get your focus on Him, you don't even worry about them other people. 
You just, you just quit worrying about them. I don't even care. That's why, listen, listen, brother, I'm going to tell you something. When I was a younger preacher, when I was a younger pastor, brother, when people, there's a lot of times when people missed church and didn't come to church, it might just, just throw me for a loop. It just might drive me crazy. But as I've got older, I've just learned I'm here to worship. I'm here to preach. Yeah. I'm going to preach to the people that do show up. I ain't going to lose my, I ain't going to lose my religion. I ain't going to lose my joy. Hey, I'm going to come here and enjoy myself. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to worship. I'm going to sing and shout and preach. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to pray for the ones that ain't here. But I ain't going to lose my mind. Listen, you're never going to get everybody here at one time. And if you do, it's probably because they're going to try to vote you out. You're right, brother. You're right. We had a service one Wednesday night. Everybody showed up. And a whole bunch of members that hadn't been there in about 20 years. I said, oh boy, this ain't good. And sure enough, we about had a split, buddy. I had to shut her down run people off, and the deputy showed up. Amen. There's a song that says, Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. We see the preacher. We see the deacons, the choir, the people, the singers. We even see our friends. But do we see Him? It's all about Him anyway. It's all about Him, whether it's Wednesday night. Whether it's Sunday morning, whether it's Sunday night, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's Jubilee, amen, whether it's Bible school, Sunday school, revival, camp meeting, whatever it is, it's always all about Him. It's always got to be about Him. If it ever quits being about Him, let's shut the doors and sell the property and let's go on the road and start us a gypsy band and do something else. Hey, brother, it's always got to be about Him. Let's keep our focus right, brother and sister. Hey, and if we'll do that, God will always show up. And if God will show up, who gives a flying rip, roar, and flip what the rest of the world says? Secondly, I want to say, the focus is gone, but secondly, the fascination is gone. You know why people dry up on the Lord? Their fascination is gone. People's not fascinated with Him anymore. They remind me of... Here's a good here's a good analogy. When you're a kid, you can't wait for Christmas. Everything about Christmas is fascinating, ain't it? The lights, the music, everything. in South Georgia it feels like wintertime when you're a kid. You can see snow on the ground when you're a kid. Can't you? At Christmas. But when you get older, it's like, oh God, I can't wait for this to be over. You get grumpy. You're like the Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch and Lucy on, on Charlie Brown all combined. Ain't that right? You know I'm telling you the truth. Hey Amen. But it's still great. Jesus was born. You get off work. The kids are out of school. Time with the family. Eat, eat, eat. I mean, you eat at home. You eat at church. You have a Christmas program. I mean, it's everything still great about Christmas. But when you get older, you grump and grump. I mean, you fuss about having to cook and straighten up and all the stuff and the hustling and bustling and spending all the money and all the decorating. But it's still a great, wonderful time of year because you're celebrating the birth of our Savior. Isaiah 6, he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon His throne, a throne high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried. The door shook. Amen. Think about it. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, where mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life coat in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues off the altar, laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, 
Here I, send me. He said, I'll go. Once he saw the Lord in all his holiness and all his glory, it changed his life. He said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And the angel of the Lord took that, that, that coal off the altar and touched his mouth. And he said, who will go for us? He said, I'll go. Hey, brother, that's what's wrong with people. They've lost their fascination. Listen, remember how it was when you first got saved? Man, you couldn't put your Bible down. I mean, you couldn't quit reading it. You couldn't get enough of it. It's like an addiction, brother. I mean, you couldn't. You just couldn't go to church enough. You couldn't get enough of it. You couldn't get enough of that old time singing, that old time preaching. You couldn't get enough of your Bible. You was like this all the time. I mean, when I first got saved, I was reading it all the time, and I couldn't understand it. I read the Old Testament, the New Testament. I got it mixed up. I mean, I'd get up and I'd start preaching. I mean, I'd get up and preach at it. Hey, man, I'd, I'd tell crazy stuff, man. I'd preach that it that it rained for forty and it rained for forty years. Hey, man, if they that they slung Jezebel seven they dumb seven off that wall. I'd preach all kinds of crazy stuff. I didn't know what I was talking about. But boy, I was fascinated. And I'd get up out of that part where they took Jesus and laid him down on the cross. And they took him big old spots and drove them down in his hands and feet. And they stood that cross up there in the sun. And Roman soldiers crucified my Lord. Man, it got real to me because I knew he did it just for me. Just an old drunken dope head. Oh, brother, I was fascinated with it. Because it came alive to me. Oh, I'm going to tell you something, my dear brother and sister. That's what's wrong with people. That's why they dry up on God. That's why they sit around the house on Sunday morning. That's why they don't go on Sunday night. That's why they don't read their Bible. They're not fascinated no more. I'm going to tell you what. He's still real. He's still the most fascinating person in human history. Hey, brother, get the fire burning again down in your bosom. Amen. Amen. He's still fascinating. Amen. He's still the most fascinating person. I mean, Buddha don't do it. Muhammad don't do it. But Jesus Christ. I mean, you read about people. You see people on TV and they do stupid stuff and they talk about crazy stuff. You're like, man, you don't even get it. You don't have a clue. The people that man worships is pitiful. Oh, but I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ is the greatest man, greatest person that ever lived. And He'll change your life. He'll change your life forever. Thirdly, I want to tell you this. is why the people dry up and die. is because the freshness is gone. It's not fresh to them anymore. Kind of like a man and his wife when they first get married, they're just floating on a cloud. Man opens the door for his wife all the time and buying her flowers and candy and all that stuff. Now if I buy my wife flowers, she's like, what did you do? Right. Yeah, we had our anniversary and I said, well, you won't forget our She said, please don't get me nothing. Don't waste no money. Right. She'd get mad if I spent $100 on flowers. She'd say, honey, please, we could have done so and so with that. We could have paid a lot bill with that. Don't waste right. that money. Really? Now seriously, listen, but when the freshness is gone, listen, you think about it. The Bible says when that manna came down out there in the wilderness, it was small. Exodus 16, that speaks of His humility. It was round. That speaks of His eternal nature. It was white. That reminds us of His sinless, holy nature. It came at night. Jesus came to a world that was lost in spiritual darkness. It was, it was misunderstood, those that found it, in Exodus 16. They said, what is it? Amen. The Bible said He came to His own. His own received Him not. Amen. Listen, brother, it was sufficient for every man's need. According to Exodus 16 and 17, it was sweet to the taste. The Bible said, oh yeah, David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. It was to be kept and passed on to others. Amen. I, listen, brother, I want to tell you what. The reason that we dry up and die is because it's not fresh anymore. That's why you come to church. That's why you read your Bible. That's why you pray. That's, you stir it up and keep it fresh. It's like, listen, it's, it's like this. I went home the other day and and I don't, I don't do much cooking. I tried the George Foreman grill the other day and burnt myself. I just, I just think much of a cook. But I, Debbie said, she, she said, there's plenty of stuff there to eat. She starts listing what's there to eat. And I'm like, oh. Uh, usually she'll, I'll say, will you fix me? She'll fix me a sandwich and leave it in the fridge or I'll bring it with me. That's bad. I'm spoiled. Oh, she'll give me $20 and say, drive through McDonald's and get you a Happy Meal. I keep the change. 
Serious. And so she said, she said, there's like three things. There's roast beef, ham, and turkey. And she said, I got some of that bread you like. And I thought, I have to open up a pack of ham and then open a loaf of bread. Do y'all ever do that? I have to go through all that. Then I get a paper towel off the rack and lay it on the cabinet. Gosh, that sounds like a lot. Of... So here I go. I open up that ham. I open up that bread. And that heel's on the end. I don't like it heel. And that next little piece of bread, I don't like it either because it's kind of too close to a heel. The brother of a heel. So I dig down about middle ways. Kind of that fresh piece. And dig it out. And by that time, when I get ready to close up that piece of bread, that little twisty goo thing's gone. I've never been able to find one of them once I take it off in my life. So I hold the bread up and spin it one real good time, tuck it under and slide it back on. That's a man's way of doing it, brother. Amen. Every man in here does that probably. Just give it a spin, tuck it under there and stick it back in the cabinet. She'll never notice. But she always does notice. She probably comes home and says, that idiot. And she finds the little twisty thing and puts it back. But listen, that's the way our Christian life ought to be. You, you dig around, you stir around, you find the fresh part. And you have to do whatever it takes to keep it fresh. That's like a man and his wife, your relationship. You do whatever it takes to keep it fresh. If you've got to take her out to eat once a week, bless God Almighty, if that's what it takes, take her out once a week to keep it fresh. If that's what it takes, do it. It ain't going to kill you. Hey, brother, do whatever you've got to do to keep your spiritual life fresh. Don't let it get stale. I'll tell you what, the more you read your Bible, you might, you, you might believe this, you might not, but the more you read it, the fresher it is. The more you'll want it, the more you'll like it. But if you'll let it go a few days, it'll get stale and you won't like it as much. And it's harder to read. But if you'll read it every day, you'll get addicted to it. And you're like, man, I miss reading my Bible. I don't, I don't want to listen to that old country music. Ugh, it don't taste good no more. Won't you? Did y'all read here a week or so ago, where over in Deuteronomy 21, where it said, I'm getting off my message, but I'm going to jump back on this in a minute, where it said if your son was a rebel and he was a glutton and a drunkard, what to do with him? Did you read that in the Old Testament? What did he say to do to him? didn't say spank him, give him time out. I'm talking about a teenager. Take him out in the street and stone him. Woo! How about that now? I wonder how many... I wonder how many young American teenage bums would last nowadays. Stone him. Kill him. I told David, he said, good night. Did you read that? I'm talking about, he said, if he, was a, if he was a drunk and a rebel and wouldn't obey his parents, take him out in the street and have the elders come out and stone him, kill him, and make an announcement, he won't obey me and his mama, and he's a glutton, which means he's a fat, lazy slob. All he does is lay around and eat out of the icebox, eat out of the refrigerator. Won't close the bread thing back up. And he's a, he's a drunk. He lays around drunk, comes home drunk, and he won't work, won't do nothing, and we killed him. Man! God don't mess around, does He? They didn't have, they, they didn't have welfare and food stamps back then. Right. Right. Amen? I told David, I said, reckon anybody ever done that? I bet them young men read that back then. I bet they said, I'm going to work Daddy. Daddy, fire me up a chainsaw too when you crank yours up. I'm going with you. Amen? Number four, the reason, last of all, that people dry upon the Lord is fourthly, friendship is gone. You know, when you, when you get saved and you serve the Lord for a while, there's a friendship that you have with Him. Muslims don't have that. Muslims don't have that friendship. The Bible said, James 4, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. If you'll draw nigh to him, he'll draw. The Bible said in the book of Proverbs, in order to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. People that have friends are friendly people. In Revelation 3, they had to be reminded that they had fallen out of love. He said, you've left your first love. They forgot what made them fall in love, and they had taken each other for granted, taken them for granted, and they're just living for themselves. Jesus is still your friend. You've just gotten less friendly. Ronnie, come on the piano. You know what makes people you know what makes people get to that place where they're uh, they just drop on the Lord. They're just not friendly with the Lord anymore. 
Jesus ain't left. He went nowhere. I keep comparing it to a relationship. Some kids that ain't married can't relate to this, but when a man and his wife first get married, they just can't get enough of each other. They're with each other all the time. Fortunately, me and Debbie's kept ours fresh all these years, and we're still best friends, and we've just always kept it that way. But you see people that's married for a long time and act like they can't stand each other. And you start thinking, what happened? Because I know you wasn't that way when you got married. You didn't get married because you hate each other. There was something somewhere. At some point, you was like, we love each other so much we can't stay apart, so why don't you marry us? And then somewhere along the line, they started drifting. Something happened. What happened? Somebody moved. You've heard the story, haven't you? An old man, old woman's riding down the road, and they pass this young couple. The man's driving, the woman's all sitting all over him. That's what I like about these new cars and bucket seats. The woman can't ride sitting beside you. And he said, the woman said, we used to ride down the road like that. No man's driving. He said, I hadn't moved. And she's sitting over yonder. I ain't went nowhere. I'm still sitting right over here driving, a woman. Slide on over here. You can be as close to him as you want to be. Lord hadn't went nowhere. Same way with the Lord as it is with a marriage. You can get two married people together that's drifted apart and they're fussing and fighting, getting ready to split up, and both of them will start accusing each other. But the truth of the matter is, both of them can be just as close as they want to be, or they can be as far apart as they want to be. But with the Lord, He don't move. He ain't changed. He's unchangeable. He says, I change not. So, if you're drying up on the Lord, guess what? It's you. And it leads to a broken friendship, a broken heart, and a broken testimony. There's been times in my life where I've drifted from Him and I wasn't as red hot as I should be and I realized it was me, it wasn't Him. Every time, every time in my life that I've grown cold on the Lord, it was always me, always. And when I came back to Him and got close to Him, He was right there where I left Him, always. I don't want to drive on the Lord. Let's stand tonight.